Imagine if you could get one of your favourite personalities all to yourself as a captive interviewee on the London Eye. Welcome to Eye to Eye with Francine Lacroix. Welcome to Eye to Eye, the interview show for high flyers. My guest today is the international best-selling author who sold more than a hundred million books. Meet Ken Follett. Ken Follett is one of the world's most successful writers. A multi-millionaire, his books have been translated into more than 30 languages. His best-selling novel, The Pillars of the Earth, sold more than 18 million copies and became a hit TV series. A $40 million production, screened successfully worldwide. Now he's embarking upon his most ambitious project yet, a trilogy of historical novels to be released over the next two years. For the next half hour, Ken Follett is our captive in a capsule on the London Eye. He's talking to Francine Lacroix about his life, his success, and the changing face of the publishing world. Ken, thank you so much for being on The London Eye with us. What makes you such a successful author? Well, I think the key factor is that the reader must engage emotionally with the book. You know, a book can be clever, it can be well written, it can be full of good ideas. But that's not enough, at least it's not enough for a popular bestseller. What people like is the emotional reaction. A tear comes to their eye, their heart beats faster. They feel indignant about something in the story or they feel scared about what's going to happen. That's the, that's the miracle of literature because, of course, they know that it's just a story that Follett made up. But nevertheless, they have those physical and emotional reactions to it, and that's what makes you take, turn the page. That's what you become involved in the fate of these characters, and you want to see what happens next. And of course, it's escapism. What we see in theatre sales and also film sales is when there's a recession, people do want to escape maybe more than when economic times are good. Do you, do you see that with the sale of your I books? I don't know if escape is what it's all about. You know, I read fiction all the time and I'm not escaping from anything. I have a fabulous life. So I don't think it's really about escaping. I think it's about drama. We create, human beings create drama even when, even when there's no real drama in their lives. You know, gambling for example. What is gambling? It's synthetic drama. Sports. We, we play sports or we watch sports because it brings a drama into our life. We say, you know, we support a football team. Oh, I'm so disappointed. Oh, we won. It's, it's synthetic drama. And fiction is a way of having drama without actually any of the costs of drama. You know, you can have a war without actually getting shot at. So we love, human beings love drama. And I think that, I think that it's not about escape, it's about drama. How has the way you do your business changed over the last 35 years? Today it's audiobooks. Do you have to be present in the film market to become more well known and therefore more successful? Well, movies help, of course, and so does television, but, but it's certainly not essential. Uh, but I think it's great that we now have all these different ways to bring our stories to the public. Uh, you know, if people, we have, uh, audiobooks are great. There's a percentage of people who struggle to read, dyslexic people, you know, it's about 4% about of the population is severely dyslexic. Uh, and blind people, for example, and we, so we have audio books. have e-books for people who would rather read on a, a screen than carry a book around. How does the internet change the way that you, I guess, run your business? You have more reviews, you have more access to a lot of these books simply by going on blogs or the internet. The internet is great for me because I've always done a lot of research for my books and I used to use the Encyclopedia, I used to look at the Encyclopedia Britannica once a day. I haven't looked at it now for years. It's just so much easier to Google it. Of course, you've got to be a little bit careful because sometimes the information you get on the internet isn't right, so you've got to check it. But nevertheless, you know, if you want to check the spelling of, I don't know, Joseph Goebbels, then you can do right it very there. quickly. Yeah. How does it change the way that you actually foresee things in, in the future? For example, a lot of your book sales do better one, two years 
down the line because there's a word of mouth and again is it blogs on the internet that kind of spread the word? It's really people saying to their friends, I've just read a great book. That's really how we sell books. I mean, of course, we spend, publishers spend money on advertising and so on. But the thing that really counts is if the book is so good that when you put it down, the first thing you want to do is tell your best friend, this is a great book. That's how we really sell books. That happened to the Pillars of the Earth. Initially, the Pillars of the Earth didn't sell spectacularly well, probably because most people think they're not going to be interested in a story set in the Middle Ages. But, but as the years went by, it built and built, and it became kind of a phenomenon. And that's how it happened. It happened by people saying to their friends, this is the best book I've ever read. Ken, talk to me about the publishing world. It's changed so much in the last 35 years. Is there something that you would have never thought possible maybe 10 years ago that now has happened? A lot of libraries, but even bookshops are closing. Does that affect the way that you see your business? Uh, well, it's changing, of course, and we've got to adjust to that. Nothing stays the same forever. And, um, and, and you know, change is sometimes awkward and difficult for us, but we've got to go with it. And I think overall it's very positive. You know, I think that I would never have... Who could have imagined downloads? You know, who could imagine that you'd have a screen not much bigger than your hand and you'd press a button and, and, and a whole book would somehow come mysteriously through the air to your, your e-reader? I, no, I didn't imagine that. I don't think anybody else imagined it 10 years ago. So that's, but it's great because it's very easy for people to buy the book. And, uh, Especially if they're big books. Yeah, that's right. So, so uh, overall, I think these changes are really very positive for us. We just have to adjust a little bit. Ken, how important is it to be charismatic? Because you need to sell your books at the same time. So you can be a great author, but if you're not charismatic and if you can't make yourself into a brand, then it's going to be much more difficult. I don't really agree with that. I mean, obviously, you have to write in a way that enchants people. Um, so in that way, the, the work has to have something like charisma. It has to be, and of course the picture, as it were, of the storyteller that comes through when you're reading is always a rather attractive one because the author works hard to make that happen if it's a successful book. But, but I, the important thing is to be charming in print, not in person, I don't think. We, I mean, we all do uh, a lot of publicity, and um, personally, I would hate to be sitting at home, you know, when my, I had a new book out in the shops. I wouldn't want to do that. I want to be out there telling people about it. But I don't really think it's as important as people. People sometimes talk as if the publicity is more important than the literature. But and of course, it's be. not. The, the, the book has to be something that people love. And, and if you've done that, then it's not a bad idea to, to do interviews and tell people about it. Coming up, turning talent into business. So there are loads of bright, talented young people looking out for you. And if you can write something good, then the world is your oyster. Meet Ken Follett, one of the world's most successful writers. He sold more than 130 million books worldwide to earn international recognition. But at a time when blogs and social networking are challenging the dominance of print, is it still possible to make it in the publishing industry? The conversation on the London Eye continues. Was it difficult to get published at first? It wasn't actually difficult to get published. My first book was published by the first publisher I sent it to. It wasn't very good and it wasn't a successful book. But I think the truth is that if you write something good, then um, they'll queue up outside your front door. It's not actually difficult to get published. It's not like it's not a closed world that outsiders can't get into. Most young people in publishing houses and in, in literary agencies are, are desperate to find an unknown writer and bring that writer to the notice of the world because that's how you make your reputation. So there are loads of bright, talented young people looking out for you. And if you can write something good, then the world is your oyster. Do you remember what happened between the book that was not so successful and the one that became very successful? Yes, I remember it very vividly. Uh, my first successful book was Eye of the Needle, and it was my 11th try. I had 
actually published 10 unsuccessful books. And I did, there are a number of things I did differently. It was the first book that I planned properly. And that turned out to be very important for me. There are some authors who don't need to plan, who do it kind of instinctively. But that, I'm not like that. I, so I, I planned that book very carefully, and that really worked for me. It was the first book for which I did research, and that turned out to be important for me. The, the research into everyday life during the Second World War gave me uh, a kind of, gave the story a kind of quality of, of the grain of everyday life. Uh, that gave it texture, and that's something I hadn't achieved before. And I got the pace right in Eye of the Needle. My early books were all a bit too brisk. It was because I'd been a newspaper reporter, so I'd got into the habit of writing in this very punchy style. And I had to unlearn that style for novels and, l and write in a more measured sort of way. And that was quite difficult for me, but Eye of the Needle was the the book that I achieved that with. But you went from writing thrillers to then writing Pillars of the Earth. It was a very different kind of book. Was it a gamble? Did you feel, uh-oh, I, I could really mess this up? Yeah, that was always a possibility. I mean, I, and my publishers were very worried about the Pillars of the Earth. And they said, look, Ken, you've had great success with these stories about you know, secret agents and Nazis and the KGB. Are you sure you want to write a story about building a church in the Middle Ages? Uh, but I did think that, that there was a great popular novel. I didn't want to write a difficult book. You know, I wasn't going to write the kind of book that people have to plough through and, and so on. I wanted to write a book that they would enjoy and turn the pages of. Uh, and I felt that that kind of story could be written about, about the somewhat unexpected subject of building a cathedral. If you look at your life now, what was the biggest inspiration or, I guess, your best investment in, in what your career now gives you? Uh, well, the, my most important asset is the hundreds, if not thousands, of novels that I read as a child and a young man. Because nearly everything that you know as an author about writing comes from reading. That's how you know what a sentence is, what a paragraph is, a cliffhanger, what constitutes drama, how to use dialogue to tell the story. All that you learn by reading uh, novels by other people. So when you start, as I did at the age of 21, writing fiction, you already have a huge knowledge of literature. And uh, of course I never considered that as an investment. I did it because I enjoyed it. When did you realize you were such a huge success? When it got translated into different languages or when actually you surpassed the one million sales? Well, I, I, um, when Eye of the Needle came, was, was a big success, I thought, well, a lot of people just write one book, one good book. And then my next book, Triple, was also a success. And then I thought, well, maybe they bought Triple just because they liked Eye of the Needle. And then the third book, The Key to Rebecca, was a big success. And I thought, OK, now I believe it. Now I, I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. I, I believe that I can be an author. You're a brand now. How are you going to build on that success? Through film or just focusing on, on the writing and writing many more books? The, it, focusing on the writing. You know, this is what I do well. And uh, if, if I allowed myself to get distracted, you know, for example, by going to Los Angeles to write a script for something, I think it would be a terrible mistake. First of all, I probably wouldn't be a very good script writer. Script writers tell the story in pictures and I tell the story in words. But secondly, you know, there's something that I can do that very few people can do. And I should do that. I shouldn't be, you know, I shouldn't be, uh, uh, I shouldn't be thinking, there are lots of people who can think about a brand, think about marketing, think about publicity. Loads of people can do that. Uh, and I can, I can hire people or have colleagues who can do that. But there's one thing I do that nobody else can do for me, and that's write another good book. Up next, determined to succeed. If I write the first draft of a book and it's not very good, well, I'll fix it. And if the second draft isn't good enough, then I'll, I'll go over it again and I'll keep at it until it's right. Ken Follett is a master storyteller. His novels have been translated into over 30 languages. Now he's embarking on his most ambitious project yet, a trilogy of historical novels which require extensive research. Follett is funding this himself, and he's not worried about the business risk. 
So what's the secret to his success? The ride on the London Eye continues. How do you write successful books? Do you listen to people and say, well, actually, you know, maybe we need a bit more of that? How have you progressed as an author through the years? Well, I listen to people all the time. And I show, at certain stages in the process, I show what I've written to various people, to editors, to my New York agent, who is a very good critic, uh, to my wife Barbara, and uh, to members of my family. I have a couple of friends who are very perceptive critics. So I show stuff to people all the time. Uh, I don't necessarily take their advice, but I'm always interested. You know, if they say, this chapter was a bit boring, then that, you know, that's a very serious criticism. I've got to look again at that chapter and think, oh, why, why was he bored? What, you know, what have I failed to do in this chapter? So I do that all the time, listen to people, I show my drafts to people, and I listen very carefully to what they say, and I, I take action on it. Do you fear failure? We speak to CEOs who say, instead of wanting it to get it right, I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, I'm not anxious, no. I'm not, I don't lie awake at night thinking, oh my goodness, uh, is this really any good? No, I don't have that kind of fear of failure. I have, I have that desire to please an audience that r runs very deep in me. Um, but I'm not anxious, you know, and I figure if, if, the, if I write the first draft of a book and it's not very good, well, I'll fix it. And if the second draft isn't good enough, then I'll, I'll go over it again. And I'll keep at it until it's right. Uh, it usually only takes me two drafts, but some books I've written more than that. Some books, the second draft hasn't been good enough, and I thought, and, and, you know, and my agent has said to me, it really, you, the phrase used to be, it goes through the typewriter. You would say, it needs to go through the typewriter again, and I'd think, oh, no. <laughs> but I would always do it. But how do you do your research? Do, does something catch your eye and you say, actually, I'm interested in this, so the rest of the world will be interested in it as well? Yeah, and what I think is I could, I could write a story about that. I read something in the newspapers or in a history book, or somebody tells me a story, or I see, a, see something in, on TV, and I think I could tell a story about that. And I think about you know, how I would dramatize it and what the people would be like. Uh, and that's, well, people say, where do you get your ideas? But that's, all, most authors have antennae and they're constantly searching for ideas. And then something like that happens and you think, yeah, I wonder if I could do that. So how long does it actually take you to think of a plot and then you work on this with researchers for sometimes a couple of years? Uh, it's at least two years, yeah. Two years is really the fastest for me. Uh, sometimes more pillars of the earth took me three years and three months. Uh, and that the process is first of all a long planning period, long planning period, which is six months or a year, and then the first draft, and then the rewrite. Research is crucial to your books. Are you helped by historians or philosopher? What kind of support do you have around you? Uh, yes, I certainly have uh, professional help. Mainly, though, to look for mistakes. Most of the research I do myself. I have a researcher who finds stuff for me finds out-of-print books and old maps and that kind of thing. Uh, but I, I read the books myself, or, or if I, I, I quite often interview people, police officers, for example, quite often interview police officers for research for a story. Uh, but I do that myself. I don't have somebody do it for me. But what I have other people do is read the first draft and look for mistakes. And in fact, for Fall of Giants, my latest book, I actually ended up employing eight historians to read the first draft. <laughs> I needed a specialist on the Russian Revolution, a specialist on the suffragette movement, a specialist on Germany, a specialist on America, and I ended up with eight of them. But, but you know, it's worth it because people, I think readers like the feeling that the historical background is authentic. Of substance. Yes. They're not reading it for the historical background. You know, that's a sort of extra. But nevertheless, they like to think, if I say that such and such a person was foreign secretary in 1914, then that's correct. That is, that is what the guy's name was, and it's spelt right too. <laughs> do, do you have any, you know, when you talk about all the substance and the research, is it something that you ever want to compromise on? If I have an idea for a way to do a scene, and then it turns out the research tells me that it couldn't have happened that way, well, I'll think of another way to do it. 
because I wouldn't take the, you know, I wouldn't want to give people a story that had a, a sort of a woeful inaccuracy in the middle of it. Um, I, even if I thought nobody would find out, I still wouldn't feel comfortable about it. Up next, the fight is on. We have to accept that there are terrifically attractive rival forms of entertainment and we've got to do better. Ken Follett is the literary phenomenon who conquered the publishing industry. He started as a journalist and only later in his career gave writing novels a try. 130 million books later, how did he make it? He's telling all to Francine Lacroix on The London Eye. When did you first realize that you wanted to be a writer? Well, I guess uh, it was in my middle 20s. I was working as a journalist and on a newspaper, and uh, I, I was having quite a good time, but my heart wasn't really in it. And I was writing fiction in my spare time and in holidays, in the evenings and at weekends. And I gradually realized that was what I really liked, was imaginative fiction. And that was your passion, and if you don't have the drive, it's very difficult to become a bestseller. Well, I, I've always loved stories. It's always been a huge pleasure for me. I, I learned to read when I was four. And uh, ever since then, it's been one of my greatest pleasures. Uh, and, and then I, when, when I began to write stories myself, you know, I would read something and I would think, I could do that. But do you have a favorite book, the one that maybe made you want to become an author yourself? Well, certainly uh, the, the first James Bond story that I read, which was Live and Let Die by Ian Fleming, that blew me away. I was 12 when I read that story, and it was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me. And I just thought James Bond was absolutely the picture of what a man should be. That's what I thought when I was 12. Uh, but also, you know, the story was written in that wonderful, racy style that Ian Fleming developed for the James Bond character. It was so right. And uh, when I started writing later on, what I wanted to do was give readers the kind of excitement that I'd felt reading James Bond stories. And you can be an author for all, cult all cultures. And, and that's a key, is that you have to write, I guess, something which appeals to the French, the Germans, the Spanish, the South Americans. Yes, but, uh, and I am a bit unusual in that. I, you know, there aren't many authors who appeal equally to Spanish readers and German readers and Brazilian readers and Japanese readers. Um, it has to do, it, it's something to do with the fact that I'm not English, I think. Uh, English writers tend to have a very English focus. They're much too interested, for example, in social class, question of social class. Most people around the world are bored by the question of social class. Um, and I think coming from, I'm Welsh, and so coming from a culture that isn't, that is slightly off-center in Britain, I think has helped me appeal to an international audience. Meeting readers in different countries is, uh, uh, is, a, is a, an enriching experience. In Germany, for example, they like me to read. And when they first asked me to do that, I said, well, I'll, I'll read for five or ten minutes and then answer questions from the audience. And I got a very Teutonic message back from my German publishers, publicist saying the German readers would be very disappointed if you do not read to them for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that, I mean, that's what they like. And, and, you know, and people pay, people buy tickets to come and hear authors read from their book for an hour. Uh, so, so, yes, it's, and, and, you know, in, in, in for example, uh, Italy, I can't imagine Italians sitting down for an hour listening to some guy reading. We have a short attention span in Italy, unfortunately. <laughs> There's a lot of talk about our kids nowadays dumbing down or just thinking about popular culture, just thinking about celebrities. Do you see that in, in the way that society is moving? And what impact does that have on an author? I, I don't see it. I have six grandchildren between the ages of one and 17, and they all love either to read or to be read to. And there are such wonderful books for, for, for you know, one and two and three year olds now. Mine all love a book called The Gruffalo. In fact, I took all six of them to see a stage show in London at Christmas with The Gruffalo in it. And uh, so they're, they're already terrifically into literature. They watch TV as well. Um, but you know what? 
we, if we want to entertain people, if we want to compete with television and video games and all that sort of thing, we've got to write better books. You know, all those, think of all the kids who queued up outside bookshops on, on, at 7 o'clock on Saturday morning for the latest Harry Potter. You know, they're all, they're the television generation. They could have stayed at home and played a computer game, but because J.K. Rowling wrote such a good book, they left their computers behind and went to the bookshop. That's the answer. That's what we've got to do. We have to accept that there are terrifically attractive rival forms of entertainment, and we've got to do better. But so there, there's no, are we not missing our imagination sometimes? I always say, we've got to give them something they can't get on television. Television is e very easy to watch. I want them to turn the TV off and pick up a printed book or an e-reader. And instead of looking at glamorous pictures, I want them to look at some print. And if I'm going to get them to do that, I've got to give them something that, that, that they really like and that they really want. Uh, you're very passionate about your writing. What are your other passions or ho hobbies? I know you have a, a rock band. Yeah, I'm in a blues band. It's called Damn Right I've Got the Blues. And we rehearse every Monday night uh, in, a, in, a in a soundproof studio. And then five or six times a year we play in public. I play the bass guitar. And uh, I like it so much partly because it's so different from what I do all day. Writing is very cerebral. And my books are very heavily plotted, so I'm always figuring out all the kinks and the loops in the story, figuring ahead. And playing in a band is, is very sensory. It's about the, the ears and the fingertips. And uh, it's so completely different. And anyway, it's so loud. The guitarists turn up so loud you can't think anyway. Ken, what do you hope the next 20 years will bring you? Uh, well, I'd really like to stay healthy and uh, alive long enough to see my grandchildren married and having children of their own. <laughs> and more bestsellers? I certainly hope so. Ken, thank you so much for joining us on London Eye. I hope you enjoyed it. Certainly did.